Well, we have been in a series called Killing Hostility, and ultimately, we've been doing a deep dive into the book of Ephesians and looking at this idea that Paul, who was once an uh, adversary to the Christian faith, who becomes an advocate for the faith. And it is a remarkable thing that he captures in this six-chapter letter, essentially, in which Paul puts before us that because of what Christ has done on the cross, he has killed the hostility that often wells up and develops between people. And he is specifically writing this letter uh, to a church that is now filled with both Jew and Gentile. And we've unpacked this throughout this entire series. And if you're here for the first time, you're coming in at the end of the book. But essentially what Paul is saying is he's writing a group of people who are fully aware of their differences, but they're not aware of the things that they have in common. And they are so at odds with one another. And he's saying, listen, uh, that is nonsense. If you are in Christ and you've been marked by the good news and this grace of God, well, you understand that now there is reconciliation and there is harmony and there is peace available to us because our Jesus came and bridged the ultimate chasm between us and our heavenly father. And if he can bridge that type of gap, well, there's no relational gap in our lives that Christ can't bridge, amen? And so we lean in with anticipation and we lean in with hope and, and a, a acceptance of just saying, God, whatever you wanna do in us and through us as a community of people, uh, Lord, have your way. And Paul builds this idea. And what I love about uh, the book of Ephesians, in fact, I love about all of Paul's writings is Paul is so meticulous and he's a master at building his thought and sequentially laying out the logic of his theology, which then leads into practical implications for every single one of us. How do we live out what Paul is talking about in the book of Ephesians? And as we've already established, the book of Ephesians is broken down into kind of three categories, wealth, walk, and warfare. When we talk about wealth, we are not talking about wealth in terms of how we would understand it, in terms of compensation. No, we're talking about spiritual wealth, in which Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, we are blessed in every spiritual measure. In every spiritual way, we are blessed uh, beyond our comprehension even because of Christ. We are wealthy and rich spiritually. And that should uh, lend itself and inform and shape uh, our walk. How do we live this out? And then ultimately he ends where we're gonna end today in chapter six, where he talks about this warfare that you and I will embark on some warfare. There will be resistance. There will be trials. And you are gonna have some inconvenience and some pain and some heartbreak because we live in a fallen world. And uh, so I just, I gotta tell you something what I just did there. So there's this basketball player who played for the Utah Jazz. And uh, he, his name was Jeff Hornacek. And every time he would get to the free throw line, he would uh, tap his cheek to let his kids know back home that he was waving at his kids. And uh, I just met this new family who moved here from Washington, D.C., and I was talking to him about church. I'm like, hey, if you show up and I see you, I'm gonna touch my cheek. I won't call you out, but I'll let you know I see you and I'm glad you're here. And uh, they're here. And can we just let them know that we're glad they're here? So I, uh, I just think this is an idea that we have to understand. If you are gonna live a life for Christ, uh, you're gonna bump into resistance. And the birthmark of a Christian, well, it is a target. And sometimes I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but just know uh, trouble knows where to find you. You don't have to go looking for it. And there will come moments uh, where life just punches you in the face, right? And so we're gonna figure out how do we live a victorious life in spite of those things. And so if you have your notes or pen or wanna follow along with us, we're gonna be in Ephesians chapter six. Got a good marker today. And we will be in verse 10 through 17. We're talking about the armor of God. You don't wanna grow up in a church that sang songs about the armor of God when you were kids. They taught you a whole choreographed routine. They really drove it home. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, I wanna lay out three categories that I will call the vulnerable. And quite honestly, I, I can't assess every single individual who meets across all of our campuses personally. This is something every single one of us has to answer honestly. Am I in one of these vulnerable categories? And I do think there are three people or three categories of people, I'll say, that fall into 
these um, vulnerable uh, dimensions in a sense. And then obviously we're, we're talking about the armor, which you know, has all these parts and there's these flaming arrows that scripture talks about coming from the devil hitting us in the life that we're living. How many of you guys seen the movie? This came out years ago. Mel Gibson was in it and it was called The Patriot. Wave at me, come on. All my saints have a past, right? You're sinners as well, right? I don't know if I'm gonna get in trouble for talking about this movie from the platform, but it is a historical movie in a sense. Mel Gibson is the star and he's got a haunted past in a sense and he's a widower and he is raising seven children and he is living in the time where it is the American Revolution. And the British are on the scene and there is this American militia that is developing and Mel Gibson wants nothing to do with it. He wants to move on and live a peaceful life and just be a simple farmer and to raise his children. And unbeknown to him, one of his sons decides to enlist in the, the American militia. And there comes a day where the British chase his son home and his son is chased down at the house and they capture their son and they drag him away. And they start the house on fire and Mel Gibson comes running into the scene and he runs upstairs and he gets into this uh, chest and he pulls out two muskets and he turns and he hands them to his two younger sons and he says, follow me. And they run out the burning house and they chase down the British and he tells his kids, he says, hey, you start picking them off like a, a sniper. And then Mel Gibson with two machetes just absolutely spazzes out and does what Mel Gibson does. And I, I say that because in, in many ways, here's a man who, didn't want anything to do with the fight, didn't want to be involved in it, wanted to live peacefully. Uh, but the fight came to his front doorstep. And that is often the case for many of us. We would love to just go through life peacefully, minding our own business. But have you ever discovered sometimes the fight just comes to your doorstep, whether you asked for it or not? And what I love about the, that scene is he turns and he hands the muskets to his two little boys and he says, let's fight because there come moments where everyone in the family needs to know how to fight. There's no carpool lane to heaven. God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. So every single one of us needs to learn how to embrace our relationship with God and how to live out our faith. Whether you are 80 years old or whether you are eight years old, you can do this because Christ has made it possible, amen? And so we all have to learn to engage in this. And Paul says some remarkable things, but again, if you go to the page of the scripture, Ephesians chapter six, we'll read it once more. Verse 10, he says, finally, it's almost as if Paul has been building this hefty, loaded, pregnant thought, and he gets to the end of his letter, and it's as if he is arriving at the point he set out to make. Finally, we're, we're here. All of this leads us to this point that should ready us to live this life of faith in this fallen world. And it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So if, if you're playing Captain Obvious, which I think is probably where you should always start when reading God's word, is just make some very obvious observations. Don't overthink it initially, just start making obvious observations. What jumps out the page that is just simple and clear? And for one, it would say, you know, that you and I are to uh, live in the strength of the Lord, not in our own strength. Look at that opening statement. He says, finally, live in the strength of the Lord 
and in God's mighty power. And in this series, we've been talking about this, this truth, this theological concept that Paul is constantly hammering home. And that is, if you are a Christian, that you have repented and yielded your life to Christ and you are fully devoted to following him, well, you are in Christ. That's amazing in that you and I now live from a posture of his position, his power, and his provision in our life. Does that make sense? It's not our own power. It's, it's his power. And Paul wants us to understand that there's a, there's a spiritual battle, but you can be triumphant, not because you're that impressive, but because God is that amazing that your personal faculties will be exhausted and you will come up short, but greater is he that is within you than he that's within the world is what scripture's letting us know. It's his power. I think anytime you go to scripture, what you're gonna discover is God has this way of flipping paradigms upside down to reorient our life to his word, his will, and just his ways. And what you will discover is Paul is often pointing us to this idea that it is in our weakness that we are made strong. Another way of saying it is God specializes in bringing men and women to the end of themselves. Also that they can discover the full ability and willingness of God to work in and through our lives. If all you ever do is up to your control, well, you are selling yourself, uh, selling yourself short. But there come moments where life becomes too much to bear. And it's in those moments where we recognize, I don't have what it takes to be triumphant in this moment on my own. God, he steps in and we experience his power. It is in God's power. So when we start talking about this idea of spiritual warfare, know the battle's already been won, know that the champion is on our side, and know that he does the heavy lifting and you and I get the trophy. That's an amazing thing. It is in God's power. You track with me on that? In addition to that, he says, when the evil day comes, not if an evil day comes, that this is going to happen and you don't have to be even that old and live that long to understand how this works. You could be a teenager and you've already discovered there are times in your life where you went to bed on a normal day and you woke up to an evil day. Something happened in the world, something happened in culture, something happened in society, in our community, at your school, on your team, within your house, and it's like, I did not expect this. Makes me think of a time where my boys got into a little bit of an argument. At the time, they were much younger, ages three and five. And Cannon and Miles were having this argument. Miles leaves the room, and I'm talking to Cannon, who was pretty irritated with his younger brother. And I said, you know, buddy, like being an older brother's tough, but here's the deal. When God surveyed humanity, and God was thinking, who could be the perfect best uh, big brother to Miles? Out of all the boys in the world, he chose you uh, to be Miles's big brother. And I thought that would, you know, compel him, to which Cannon responded, well, I didn't have a say in any of it. <laughs> and I think that is, well, that's often the case for many of us. We don't have a say in a lot of this. You didn't have a say in when you would be born, you didn't have a say in the fact that you would be born into a fallen world with a broken nature. You didn't have a say in the family you would be born into, the time of history, the culture, the society. You didn't have a say, but now we're here and this is our reality. And the good news of the gospel is there is hope and there are some choices that we can make to still be triumphant over the things that we didn't have a choice in. Is that making sense? And so Paul wants us to know that it is in God's strength that there is an evil day coming and there is an adversary, a devil, an evil one who is constantly trying to torment our lives. Now, this gets a little nuanced for us in the Christian community. There are three primary camps when it comes to evil, wickedness, trials, and inconvenience. And one will be the, the sociologists. Some sociologists will say, well, everything has to do with the environment. You are shaped and conditioned by your context and your environment. And so if there's anything wrong with you, it's because of external matters. It's the, it's the nature versus nurture argument. I would say in my definitions, I believe nature is how God made you. Nurture is what sin has done to you. 
Sociologists, they, they, some, not all, but some would lean heavily and specifically solely on the idea that you are a byproduct of your environment. The, there are some psychologists in another camp who would solely say, no, you are the byproduct of your own personal decisions, your own personal faculties. It's all an internal matter in which the way you think, the way you behave, the choices that you make and the decisions that you follow through with, well, they shape and determine the life that you live and they either, either lead to benefits or they lead to consequences. And we don't have anyone making perfect decisions out here. And so every single one of us understands the consequences that come with faulty decisions. And then there are those in the supernatural camp those who just see a devil behind every corner and everything is spiritual. And I love the story of a church service where the church was inside meeting, the pastor is preaching and uh, they end the service and the pastor walks out the doors of the church and stand, uh, seated on the steps of the church is the devil. And the devil's in there, uh, out there crying and the pastor says to the devil, hey puny little devil, why are you crying? to which the devil says, because everybody inside is blaming me for all their problems. And you know, sometimes there are camps that wanna solely focus on one of these three areas. And the Christian theology and doctrine would say, all three camps are right and all three camps are wrong. They're right in the sense that yes, your environment, your context, the world around you shapes you, it has an impact on you. Uh, yes, you are right that a lot of things are internal, the way you think and the way you behave and the decisions that you make. Yes, there's a psychology of component to this. And yes, there is a supernatural spiritual component to this. You're all right, but where you're wrong is to think that it's just one of the three. Uh, our Christian theology would say it's actually all three. Scripture says that we all bump into resistance and it comes in three forms. The world the flesh, and the devil. And in this situation, Paul is elevating, but understand how this devil, this adversary of ours operates. In fact, he says that you and I ought to know the schemes of the devil and know that there are arrows being fired our way, right? And, and I would say this, when it comes to those living vulnerable, and this is where when we jump into this, you might wanna consider, am I in any of these categories, right? I would say one, there is the unprepared. Then there is the untrained. And lastly, there is the unwilling. The unprepared are those who are living in this fallen world and they have no idea what hangs in the balance every single day of their life. They have no idea that there is a, a God who loves them, a God who is for them, and a God who has done remarkable, unthinkable things on behalf of them. And so there are spiritual resources available to all of us that most people go through life completely unaware of and therefore they are unprepared uh, for what is coming their way. There are some who are untrained because maybe they were misled. And if they were, chances are it was because of someone like myself who stood on a platform and promised them a fairy tale. Hey, give your life to Christ and you'll never have an argument in your marriage. Give your life to Christ and your kids will only be respectful. Give your life to Christ and you'll lose 30 pounds and you'll be rich and all these wonderful things will happen. You'll wake up every single day to angels playing harps in the corner of your bedroom and bringing you slippers. You'll come down the stairs and your kids will be singing worship music and reading the Bible. If you give your life to Christ today, just you wait, tomorrow will be perfect. Come on, where are my saints at who are laughing, right? You gave your life to Christ and your car broke down. You gave your life to Christ and your spouse lost her mind. You gave your life to Christ and your company downsized. That, that's just not the reality. And so it recognizes that there is a training that we all have to go through. There is a, an equipping that is intended to ready us for the life that God designed for us to live. And so much of what we do as a church gathering is to equip and to train uh, individuals to live this thing well. And, you know, I will say that probably for the last five years, this has been a, a massive wrestling uh, for me 
as a pastor. In fact, it was one of the big mental hangups for me uh, before I accepted this position three years ago to serve as your pastor. Because quite honestly, I don't think, and I still don't think, um, I really fit the mold of a mega church pastor. Uh, there are others who are just so much better at this deal. If you listen to the things I preach about, uh, it's actually terrible content if you're trying to build a crowd. Uh, I'm just not one who tickles the ears and sometimes I, I find that I'm like, oh my goodness, that's, that's probably gonna turn some folks away. But the reality is, is over the last five years, I've, I've watched you know, the approach to spiritual formation in the church at large, and I've watched the, the tendencies and the trends within the community of faith across our nation. And what has been so disheartening to me is to see how many individuals are being exposed of a shallow faith and how many individuals are just being tossed to and fro by the, the waves of culture and the waves of society and so much of my conviction has become, I, I could care less about building a crowd. Uh, my entire aim is to build a Christian. Like what would happen if we just built Christians? And so there is a training and, and some of you, you know, are discovering the benefits to being in a life group, to developing some spiritual disciplines of prayer and God's word and living out the attributes of righteousness and holiness and the benefits of corporate worship and gathering, where you can look down the row and realize, my goodness, I didn't know God could work in situations like that. And I didn't know God could work in situations like that. And it's something about spaces like this that edify our lives. And then the last category of the vulnerable would be the unwilling. And, and there are some who are, are just going to stand at odds, unwilling to accept the things that we we believe, and, and that's okay. We can respect those individuals and we don't have to be abrasive to, towards them. Uh, I would just say as gently as I possibly can, if that remains your stance and mindset, you are placing yourself in a very vulnerable position. And I think time will make that clear to you. And so Paul is, he's laying this out. And one thing that he says is, hey, there are these, there's this scheme and there's this strategy of the devil. There are these flaming arrows. And I would just say at a very high level, I would say one, you could call desire. Two, you could call doubt. Three, you could call deception. And four, you can call decision. So again, if you're an athlete, you understand the importance of a scouting report. Most people have no idea the opponent they're facing. Well, understand this is, the boring approach to Satan's agenda in our life. Satan is uh, extremely predictable and runs the same play. In fact, from the very beginning, Satan shows up on the scene in the garden, Adam and Eve, right? And he runs a play of temptation that causes them to fall, sin enters the world. Well, Jesus shows up Thousands of years later, Paul refers to him as the second Adam. We've established this in other places in this series. And he walks out into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. Satan shows up, and what does Satan do? He runs the same play he ran thousands of years ago. And so it's recognizing I have a very predictable opponent. And the same play he ran against Adam and the same play he ran against Christ is going to, in many ways, be the same play that he runs against me. And he starts with this desire and he understands the power of our appetites. That the, the favorite word or the only word that your appetite knows is more. And most of the trouble that we invite into our life is a result of unchecked appetites in our lives, unfulfilled appetites. And my question for you would be, what is the unchecked, unmet appetite or desire in your life? And as you struggle to figure it out, just know Satan already has it pinpointed. And so it is learning to identify, hey, what is my desire? Because Satan preys on our appetites. Satan preys on our desires. And from our desires, he begins to infuse doubt because he tries to, tie our unmet desire to an unfulfilled promise of God. Is God good? 
Is God faithful? You know, this is the desires of your heart. I thought God grants the desires of your heart. And then there's this twisting mechanism where he begins to kind of deceive us, right? And that's where the desire goes to doubt that then becomes deception where we get disoriented and we start to make decisions that are contrary to God's will in our life. Now, let's make this more practical. If you go to the Bible, you go to Matthew chapter four, it won't be on the screen today. I'm gonna paraphrase it. And as homework, you're gonna go home and read it this week. And Jesus goes out into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. And at the end of his fast, Satan arrives on the scene and Satan begins to tempt him. In fact, he tempts him in three ways. And he begins all three temptations with the same statement. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, right? And he then ties to that statement some challenge. Well, if you are the son of God, prove it. And here's what Satan knows. If he can get you proving, he can get you moving. If, if Satan can entice us to overextend ourselves and begin living beyond ourselves for a different purpose so we can prove to others or prove to him, right? Well, suddenly it moves us off base and out of our lane with Christ. Is that making sense? If he can get you proving, he can get you moving. Just for the record, I'm, I'm referring to him as a he. I don't think that's theologically correct. I think the devil is an it. It's just how it comes out of my mouth. But nonetheless, I think sometimes we are falling into temptation trying to prove ourselves in unnecessary ways. And you know, as we place our faith in Christ, you and I become children of God. You are a child of God. You don't have to prove that to anyone. You don't have to perform in a way. Like, no, you are a child of God. Think about your own kids. My kid was my kid before they talked, before they walked, before they ever went to school, before they ever played a sport. No, it was my kid because they are my kid. You don't have to prove those things. And I think sometimes we... We just fall into overextending ourselves and exhausting ourselves also that we can prove to others or maybe even prove to our adversaries who we are in Christ. In addition to that, I think it's interesting because you know Satan tells Jesus, if you are the son of God, turn these rocks into bread. And you know, at the moment, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days, so he's clearly hungry. And Satan tries to prey on that temptation, that desire, that appetite. And here's my question for you, is have you ever been tempted to eat a rock? No, it's, it's crazy. But Jesus was tempted to eat a rock. Well, why? Because the reason why you and I are not tempted to eat rocks is because you and I don't have the ability to turn a rock into bread. But Jesus had the ability to turn a rock into bread, therefore he was tempted by it. And where I think sometimes we miss the temptation conversation is a lot of times people think, oh, I gotta shore up my weaknesses because it's in the areas of my weaknesses that I'm gonna fall into temptation. And sure, there's some wisdom in that. Be mindful of your weaknesses. But I think more than that, we are tempted in the area of our strengths, not our weaknesses. That Satan has this agenda to come and try to repurpose the gifts and the talents and all that God has blessed us with. So yeah, God may have given you a sense of humor and it is Satan trying to make you condescending. God may have given you intellect and it is Satan trying to make you, uh, you know, corrupt or take advantage of others. You know, God, you know, God may have given you say, a, a skill of communication and you're persuasive, but Satan is trying to make you manipulative. You, you have to understand it is in the area of your strength. What are you good at? Well, what, what does Paul tell Timothy in, in his letter to Timothy? Guard the good deposit. That there are good things that God instilled in you and you have to guard those things because there is an agenda at play that will seek to repurpose those things for destructive matters you will be tempted in the area of your, of your strengths. In, in addition to that, like the identity thing is massive. You are gonna be tempted in the area of your identity. That goes to that whole proving idea. And it is amazing to me because we are living 
I think in very unique and accelerated times where we are witnessing and discovering things uh, for the first time. When I was growing up, the only crisis an individual went through was a midlife crisis. Then about 10 years ago, I come across a book called The Quarter Life Crisis. And what this book was arguing was now young adults are having the same type of identity crisis that someone would at the age of 50 at the age of 25. And the, the book would go on to argue that the reason for this is if you pay attention to all the conversations with young people, by the time they're a freshman in high school, it's, hey, where are you gonna go to college? Where are you gonna go to college? What are you gonna study? Where are you gonna be for your life? What are you gonna, what are you gonna do for your career? And there's this pressure that now young people bear every single day where they're attaching anxiety to their purpose at a very young age. I remember reading that book and thinking, that is crazy that you have now individuals in their mid-20s going through an identity crisis. Well, now we wake up in 2024 and you have children who are eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old at scale and at an alarming rate going through significant identity crises all around the world and it's being celebrated and championed. This is problematic. And so as believers, when we stand fortified in understanding my identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. And I'm telling you, it is the one thing that can guard our hearts and guard our minds from an agenda that is set to hijack all of our identity. Because your identity determines your activity. I've said this before, but like, you don't go to a dentist to fix your car. And you don't go to a mechanic to fix your teeth because a person's identity determines their activity. And it's just recognizing who I am determines what I do. I have to remember I am a child of God and I am in Christ, bought with an incredible price, chosen, selected, adored, saved and secured by the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords and my heavenly Father, amen? That is my life. And this is something that is going to be all throughout your life, you're going to bump into temptation. I would say in a very simple way of understanding it, if you think of H-I-T, I'll put it down here at the bottom. I often tell young leaders, hey, you have to be careful that you don't get hit in a way that is detrimental to your life. And this, so Jesus, again, he's in the wilderness, he's hungry, he's isolated, and he's tired. He's hungry, he's isolated, and he's tired. And I'm just telling you, if there's ever a season in your life where there's an unchecked appetite, where you have found yourself now drifting into isolation and you are fatigued, I would raise the awareness because you have now become a primary target for the enemy's scheme and agenda in your life. Don't get hit. Go code orange and raise the awareness. Wait a second, I'm hungry, I'm isolated, and I'm tired. These are the moments where Satan preys on people. And that fatigue one is massive because I think problems are exaggerated when people are exhausted. And it's just learning to be mindful of what is happening in you and around you also that you can stand the test of time when it comes your way because there will be an evil day. And Paul says, so in light of this, put on the full armor of God. Timothy Keller, who is probably in the top five influencers of my personal faith and theology, a brilliant writer, pastor who recently passed away, uh, he, he said it this way. He said, the armor of God symbolizes the privileges and the benefits of the gospel. It's a great idea of thinking about it. The armor of God, it symbolizes the privileges and the benefits of the gospel. He, he would go on to say it this way. He would say, if you find yourself on your back in your faith, chances are there are spiritual resources you're not utilizing. If you find yourself on your back in your faith, Chances are there are spiritual resources that you 
are not utilizing. And so Paul's saying, hey, wake up every single day and take a moment and put on the full armor of God. Which I'm often asked, like, hey, when should I pray? Should I pray in the morning or should I pray in the evening? And uh, I would just say, pray at all times. You know, it doesn't have to be like this, hey, I'm on my knees, I got my hands folded, I got my eyes closed. Um, I just talk out loud, I'm always talking to God. But if you're trying to build a discipline of prayer, uh, here's how my logic plays out. I think it is just wiser to pray in the morning than it is in the evening. I would rather pray for my day than to live a you know, chaotic day and then pray about it, right? Like, God, I wanna proactively pray about my day and God, ask for your favor, your guidance, your provision, your protection. God, I wanna set the course and before I even start my day, I'm going to invite you into my life and I'm going to put on the full armor of God. So take a moment before you uh, devote your attention or energy to anything else, ready yourself for the life that you're trying to live, right? So take a moment. In addition to that, take a stand, which we live in a world that gives us opportunity after opportunity to stand in our convictions and our values. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what context you find yourself in. There's always going to be a thing or a situation or a dynamic that is running against the grain of your faith. Come on, wave at me if you've ever discovered that. It's like there's so much pressure coming against our faith. And Paul says, yeah, when you put on the full armor of God, take a moment, now take a stand and march out as a child of God, representing God's desire for your life as well as his goodness in the world, right? So take a stand, live anchored to your values. But beyond that, I would say take a hit. Not this kind of hit. I know that's kind of confusing. But know this, life is going to hit you. It just happens. There's this scripture that refers to the cross and it says, on the hour that was most glorifying. Think about that. That's how it describes the cross, as a glorifying hour. Well, when I look at the cross, it's a horrifying hour, not a glorifying hour. Does that make sense? And I think there is this profound kind of reversal that in some ways you and I have to take a hit in order for those around us to know we're legit. It's weird that it happens that way, but sometimes you don't understand or you don't discover or you can't see the substance or the validity in a person's character and, and their values and their convictions until something smacks them and they stand their ground. Until something comes against them and they remain fortified and resolute. And my challenge to, to you would just be ready yourself for the moments in life where you're gonna take a hit. And there is gonna come a moment where if you are prepared, yes, you will take a hit, but you will overcome what comes your way. And in some way, you will glorify God through the midst of your pain, the midst of your trial, and the midst of your inconvenience. That's a wonderful thing. Paul goes on to explain it, and he says, okay, there's, there's all these pieces, and again, this is where being in a life group is, is wonderful because it helps us really digest and apply this stuff. I would say this, and this is gonna sound like terrible math. Um, there are six pieces to this armor. Five of them are defensive. Two of them are offensive. And again, you're thinking, that, well, that's bad math. You said there's six pieces, you just listed out seven. And the reason for that is because the sword of the spirit, the word of God, is both offensive and it's defensive. But much of this armor is to fortify your life so you can take the hits that come your way within the world. So you have this helmet of salvation that you guard your mind knowing that you are saved and secured, loved by God because there's gonna be things that are always trying to torment your life. And if it comes into your mind, it's gonna come out through your life. Martin Luther, the great leader of the Protestant Reformation, he once said, you can't keep the birds from flying around your head, but you can keep them from building nests within your hair. 
And so it's just recognizing, hey, I, I place every single day the helmet of salvation. I know who I am in Christ. I know the truth and I know God's desire for my life. I have this helmet of salvation. I have this breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteousness is a massive concept in scripture, very simply, uh, so we can grab a hold of it. Uh, you can think of righteousness as relational rightness. That God said, you know, once Jesus was asked, hey, what's the most important commandment in the Bible? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and there's another one like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the better you and I get at relationships, the better life becomes. The quality of your life is directly influenced by the quality of your relationships. And there's something about this relationship with Christ that sets us up for relational success. And this relational rightness, it guards our heart. That's not to say that you're not gonna have some heartbreak and pain in life, but the better you get at relationships, it will guard your heart from unnecessary pain that we often face due to relationships being mismanaged. There is a relational rightness. And in addition to that, there is this imputed righteousness where we take on the character of Christ and we grow into his stature. That's a wonderful thing. There's also the point where it says there is the belt of truth, which the belt was the most important piece. In fact, it was the piece that held the whole assembly together. Without the, uh, the belt, the whole armor falls apart. And, and I'm just telling you, we live in a world that wants to do away with truth. Okay, go ahead and do away with truth and see what falls apart in your life. Hey, there's no such thing as truth. And the person who's saying there's no such thing as truth is declaring that as truth. It's kind of a bizarre contradiction. Nothing's true except what they're saying, right? I do believe there's truth. I believe God's word is the source of truth. And I want us as a community to always be unapologetic and unwavering in our commitment to the word of God and his truth for our lives and understanding scripture is that source of truth, amen? That's what we anchor our lives to. He goes on to talk about the sword of the spirit, which again is the word of God. And then he talks about the boots of peace, which is just a great idea. And, you know, this idea, the boots of peace, well, that would be the other offensive, you know, piece of the armor. These boots imply, um, well, what's the country song? These boots were made for walking, right? That they were made for us to progress and to move forward. And that is amazing because sometimes I think we fail to recognize the invitation of Christ, which was follow me, right? It wasn't just, hey, just pray this prayer and you're good. It was, no, follow me. Would you take, every single day, would you take a step in my direction and would you follow my prompting for your life? Which means if you're a follower of Christ, we live on the go. And every single day we put on these boots of peace and we march out the gospel and the good news and the message of grace and the peace for the world that is represented in Christ and Christ alone. We march out with these peace, uh, boots of peace. And I, I love that because there comes this point, Jesus calls his earliest disciples together and he brings them to a place called Caesarea Philippi, which at the time was like uh, the most heinous place worshiping all these just false gods and there's all this corruption and immorality taking place on scene. And it was there at what was referred to as the gates of Hades that Jesus makes this statement. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I love that statement because what's the purpose of a gate? To keep something out. And Jesus shows up and he's standing on the doorstep of what symbolizes the gates of hell. And he's saying, I just want you to know that what I'm about to initiate in the world, hell itself can't keep us out. And so we put on our boots of uh, peace and we march out and we storm the gates of hell as soldiers in Christ in a sense. I think that's a wonderful idea. I think anytime the church avoids the world, the church avoids its purpose. That we, ain't, we, we shouldn't be afraid of what's out there. 
because we know how great our God is and we stand in his might, we stand in his power, fortified by his armor, and we move forward representing the message of peace in Christ. And it is this gospel that kills hostility. So lastly, I would say, take a moment, take a stand, take a hit, and every single day, just take a step. Take a step in God's next direction for your life. God, what do you wanna do in my marriage? God, what do you wanna do in my career? What do you wanna do in the lives of my children? God, is there anything that you're seeking to do in any area of my life, and would you make it clear to me what is the next step, and who in my life are you entrusting me to have influence in? I'm going to take a step. And Paul, he gets down the road, and I love how he ends with this. He finishes his whole thing about the armor of God, and this is his, his closing remarks to the church in Ephesus and this wonderful letter about killing hostility. Verse 18, he picks it up and he says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. A mark of spiritual maturity is someone who doesn't just pray for themselves, but someone who understands the beauty and the benefit for praying for others. God, I I lift up my brothers and sisters in Christ and those who I worship with uh, at Northview, but those around the world, a a part of the Big C Capital Church, God, would you bless and would you fortify, would you guide and would you provide for every single one of those who call upon your name. Verse 19, pray also for me that whenever I speak words, uh, whenever I speak, Words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. I would just say, yeah, pray for your pastor Uh, because the days are getting even harder for churches and it's sad to me that on average right now, 2,000 pastors a year are just walking away from the ministry. Go be a life coach because it's easier to give life advice and not do it under the banner of Christ but we're gonna stand here and we're gonna declare it boldly every single week. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And watch, I'm gonna skip ahead to verse 23. It says, peace to brothers and sisters and love with faith from God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an un dying love. And I I just wonder what would happen if every single day we took a moment, we took a stand, we took a hit, and we took a step, all so that when all is said and done, they will describe our lives as living with an undying love for the one who died for his love for us. That would be amazing. Amen.